Marchosius. The day spirit, or the day demon, or the day Goetic uh, character, for this particular decan that we're in right now, decan of the zodiac. And it just happens to be, there's also a the night spirit, Dentilion. I think that's Dentilion, yeah. Uh, and it, they just happen to be also assigned to the best freaking tarot card that you love to see show up in a in a reading for uh, in most cases. Anyway, it's it's today's, uh, and uh, if you have a pencil and. Uh, a piece of paper handy, piece of scratch paper handy. Uh, well, that's a pretty complex little design there. Uh, but uh, you can freeze this frame and uh, copy it. You don't have to put the circle around it or, or anything else if you don't want to. As a matter of fact, the symbol itself just looks like uh, just looks like that okay now I'm only doing this uh, uh, so when you play this back in retrospect uh, if you want to uh, 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 copy it yourself to to do some little uh, act of magic uh, concerning this spirit. Uh, you'll be able to uh, to have uh, the image there. Uh, Goi vocation is a is a funny subject uh, in so much as, uh, first of all, it has such a terrible reputation and it seems like it's uh, not, a, not a very spiritual thing to do and uh, most people think of it in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, lower aspects, uh, a form of low magic. And uh, uh, I'm gonna talk a li little a bit about it, uh, because there there are times in our lives that uh, we would feel absolutely justified in our own spiritual integrity to wisely direct uh, uh, the more gross and blind forces uh, at our uh, at our disposal uh, to actually affect some kind of uh, uh, material concrete change uh, in our life and it, obviously you could see how that would be completely uh, you know open to uh, uh, abuse and uh, Notice that I prefaced the whole thing uh, with the caveat that if you are confident in your own wisdom and spiritual integrity to do that in the same way as you wouldn't want to operate a firearm uh, if you weren't confident that uh, you're safely trained and uh, are, are able to, uh, to use it safely. Uh, one of the first uh, things that I wrote uh, together with uh, my friend uh, uh, Christopher Hyatt way back in the 90s, in early 1990, uh, was uh, Alistair Crowley's Illustrated Goetia, where we talk about this. I'm going to read a couple things from uh, from that book, 
where this is concerned. But before I do that, or the first part of it, will be the uh, what it says about uh, Marchosius, because that is today's, let's see if I can find him quickly here. March 1st through March 10th. The 35th spirit is Marchosius. He is a great and mighty Marquis, appearing first in the form of a wolf or ox, having griffin's wings and a serpent's tail and vomiting fire out of his mouth. But after a time at the command of the exorcist, he assumes the shape of a man. He is a strong fighter. He was of the order of dominations. He governs 30 legions of spirits. He told his chief, who was Solomon, that after 1200 years, he had hopes to return to the seventh throne. It just says one thing that he does. He is a strong fighter. If the world events that are swirling around us now are, are such that we feel that we need the aid of a strong fighter, um, Marchiosis might be the uh, uh, a likely candidate for Goeshiki vocation. That being said, here's how I started chapter three. I started. I called it the danger of high magic. The single supreme ritual is the attainment of the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. It is the rising of a complete man in a vertical straight line. Any deviation from this line tends to become black magic. Any other operation is black magic. If the magician needs to perform any other operation than this, the knowledge and conversation operation, it is only lawful insofar as it is necess a necessary preliminary to that great work, that one work. And that's Aleister Crowley in theory and practice. It is no secret that to many modern students of esoterica, Goetia has a decidedly shady reputation. On a scale of spiritual practices, one might find Goetia sandwiched somewhere between packs with the devil and uh, addiction to the Ouija board. This attitude is understandable. After all, Goetia is the intentional conjuration of spiritual beings who are, by definition, fallen angels, evil spirits and demons. From their infernal abodes, these naughty spirits are called forth to act as personal servants to the Goetic magician to extend his power and execute his will upon the earth. The magician must be ever vigilant to the wiles of the spirits. If he is unskilled or loses control even for an instant, he runs the risk of being obsessed, possessed, or even destroyed. This sounds uncomfortably like black magic. Such behavior is certainly beneath the altruistic purity of purpose that characterize the quest and disciplines of high magic and can serve only to bring out the lowest qualities of the practitioner's character. So goes the argument against Goetia vocation. 
and so far as it goes, it's a point well taken. Yes, the spirits in question are of the infernal variety, but what exactly does that mean? If we embrace for a moment the popular nomenclature of high magic, infernal relates to the subconscious stratum of the human psyche. Spirits inhabiting these regions would then be the personifications of powers or energies that lie buried in our subconscious minds, qualities of our consciousness that we have disowned. They are fallen because they have slipped from the conscious control of the deity, ourselves. Yes, they are dangerous because while they remain unmastered, they can surface, surface unbidden and wreak all the havoc, havoc modern psychology blames on things hidden in the subconscious mind. To the charge that such practices bring out the worst qualities in the magician's character, the Goetic practitioner pleads guilty, pointing out that this is precisely the purpose of this variety of evocation. If these disowned qualities are not brought forth, identified and controlled by the magician, like the rest of humanity, is doomed to be at the mercy and caprice of his own subconscious demons, never being allowed the opportunity to subdue these denizens of his psychic menagerie. But are the spirits of the Goetia simply subjective components of the magician's mind? Or is there really an independent objective quality to their natures? This fundamental question may never receive a satisfactory answer due to the fact that no one really understands the nature of matter. But one thing is certain, one who has never experienced a Goetic evocation is not qualified to voice even the most educated opinion on the subject. It is one thing to be well read on a subject, quite another to be part of the subject itself. It's an unfortunate fact that there are many individuals who make magic their life without making their life magic. Even the most talented and brilliant expounders of the art sometimes lose sight of this and focus instead on historical or technical aspects of the subject to such a degree that they ignore completely its relevance to their daily life and happiness. But how do you really feel, Lon? I'm going to read you one more little excerpt here. It's uh, the beginning of chapter five. It says, history. And I quote from the Talmud. Berakat 6. If the eye could see the demons that people the universe existence would be impossible. The format of Goetic evocation contains perhaps the most colorful and recognizable elements of any type of Western ceremonial magic. The magician, robed and armed, stands inside the magic circle, protected from the malice of the spirits by the innumerable holy names scrawled thereupon. Several feet away stands the spirit, trapped inside a triangle of the art. With his wand upraised, the magician issues his commands and the spirit reluctantly obeys. This is the stuff of sword and sorcerer movies. Yet this is precisely the method, and it has come down to us in a most extraordinary way. 
16th and 17th century Europe abounded with myriad of practitioners of the magical arts who, for the most part, were inspired by the colorful images of Middle Eastern magic. We must keep in mind that for many years, much of the Iberian Peninsula was occupied by the Moslems. Ironically, even though Islamic law dictates strict prescriptions against unorthodox spiritual practices, the occupation forces tolerated a handful of Spanish communities where certain level of spiritual freedom flourished. These pockets of liberality attracted not only the innovative practitioners of the black arts, but also the Jewish Kabbalists, whose wisdom was, for the first time, committed to writing. This period was to profoundly influence the Renaissance, and subsequent the, subsequently the entire Hermetic traditions of Western civilization. It is from this tradition that the concept of Solomonic magic was developed. Spirits call them genie, if you will, trapped in bottles, magic carpets, great treasures protected by demons, all remnant of a thousand and one Arabian nights. The text has become known as Goetia, and it's the first book of what's commonly referred to as the Lamegaton, a collection of five texts traditionally attributed to King Solomon. The most popular versions, including the one Crowley hired S. L. McGregor Mathers to translate, were drawn primarily from translations of Sloan manuscripts number 2731 and 3648 in the possession of the British Library. Few individuals today are so naive as to believe that the author was indeed the legendary Hebrew king. Indeed, there is no evidence to demonstrate that the five texts are even the work of a single author, or that the authors were even practicing magicians. In fact, by the very nature of the translations, it's obvious that the scribe or scribes were decidedly hostile toward the act, toward the art. Many of the spirits are clearly the gods and goddesses of older religions who were banished to the infernal regions by the new order. Many of the dukes especially seem to have been originally female in character. A almost dangerous spiritual idea to lonely monastic scribes prone to fantasies. Magic books attributed to King Solomon circulated throughout Europe since at least the middle of the 16th century. Sloan Manuscript 2731 dates from 1687 and most likely is the result of one practitioner's desire to have his favorite Solomonic works bound conveniently into one volume. It also appears that he used the opportunity to update texts by revising the language and using the vernacular of the day. As archaic as the language appears to us today, the Lamegaton represents a new, improved 17th century edition of far older material. How much older, we don't know. The magical revival of the late 1800s resulted in new translations, and the Lamegaton and the Goetia emerged from near complete obscurity into the light of relative obscurity. And students and practitioners of the occult have been tantalized by its mysteries ever since. Modern editions of the Goetia remain in print and continues to sell very well. Almost every student of magic worth his or her salt owns at least one copy. Yet relatively few individuals actually have participated in a Goetia evocation. 
The reasons are many, but perhaps the single most compelling exercise is rooted in the mistaken belief that in order to succeed in evocation, one must conform exactly with the procedures and conjurations outlined in the text. The seemingly endless pages of tedious, archaic, and parochial conjurations, constraints, exorcisms, and curses continue to bewilder and discourage 99% of would-be Goetic magicians. And that's what they're precisely meant to do. Here's the theory that you operate under as a Goetic magician. The universe was a very was very simple from the traditional Goetic magician's point of view. And I have to remind you that you're, you, no matter what you think, you don't have that point of view. But anyway, I digress. The universe was very simple from the traditional Goetic magician's point of view. Above him was God, the creator of the world, and the ultimate source of his authority. Below the magician was the infernal world, inhabited by demon spirits who were once angels of the Lord, but now exiled from heaven as punishment for their pride and disobedience. Their fall established the interdependent threefold world in which we find ourselves. Heaven, earth, and hell. Like the titans of Greek mythology, the infernal spirits, not God, are responsible for the maintenance of the material world, including the earthly, fleshly nature of man. As a resident of the earth, the magician stands between the divine and the infernal worlds. If he is pious before the eyes of his God, then he has the divine authority to order and control the lower spirits. To achieve this authoritative state of mind, the magician of, magicians of old recited lengthy litanies of affirmations and self-aggrandizements, itemizing their high morals and examples of religious piety. You obeyed Moses, you obeyed Aaron, and you'll obey me too. Once he convinced himself that he had the authority to command the spirit, the magician next had to achieve the subjective state of mind whereby he could actually see it. In other words, he had to get high. He had to get stoned somehow. This he induced by the use of magic words, which he recited much like a mantra. In this way, he created a strange and mystic atmosphere in which nothing was impossible and anything could happen. Standing in the circle, protected by divine names with which he had aligned himself, the magician pumped up by affirmations and intoxicated by magic words, concentrated upon the triangle until the spirit appeared. The universal, universally holy virtues of all things triune was enough to trap the spirit in the triangle long enough to receive the charge from the magician. After receiving his orders, the spirit was given license to depart, to go forth and do the magician's bidding. The text of the Goetia is filled with details of such operations page after page of formal conjurations, constraints, invocations, curses, greater curses, addresses to the spirit on his arrival and departure, etc. 
Now, there exist today Goetic magicians, both solitary practitioners and organized groups, who operate strictly by the book. The circle, the triangle, and all the diagrams are constructed exactly as illustrated in the book, the Goetia. They recite, or most often read, the conjurations, constraints, and curses exactly as written in the 1687 text. Ceremonies of some of these magicians are a thrill to behold. And without a doubt, the art will forever be perpetuated in its classic form because of their dedicated labor. It must be pointed out, however, that there is absolutely no necessity nor particular advantage to blindly conforming with the conjuration scripts of the ancient texts. The spirits are no more impressed if you say thee and thine than they are if you say you and yours. Aleister Crowley was aware of this and crafted several versions of his own conjurations. In fact, we shall see later in his own copy of the Goetia, he simply hand copied the second key of the Enochian system, the second angelic key. It's our opinion and that of other Crowley scholars, not all, that for personal Goetia conjurations, Crowley most likely in his later years discarded the traditional conjurations and simply recited the first and second Enochian calls to get him in that frame of mind. Okay, I'm digressing here. It is also our opinion that the most effective conjurations are of the magician's own design. We encourage the reader once the fundamentals of the system are thoroughly grasped, to create your own conjuration, which, like your temple equipment and your procedures, are uniquely your own. And that's how I'm preaching my gospel of do your own Goetia. But grasp what it's about first and follow this simple formula. Something to think about when you're thinking about if you need a strong fighter. Till tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself, be good to each other. Do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. Love's the law, love under will.